So yeah, uh, I, I mean, I was talking to Sean before, and, and we were discussing like what should be the focus of, of that talk. And there are so many interesting angles, because when we started Mendeley, we were kind of students still ourselves, PhD students, that at, at some point in time decided, OK, you know, let's leave school and, and, and do Mendeley. And my, one of my very proactive decisions when I started a PhD was that I wanted to use that time to explore alternatives to, let's say, uh, Korean consulting or banking, uh, because I graduated from a business school as well in Germany. And uh, most of my colleagues actually went for one of the big consulting companies or, or, uh, or banks. So that is an interesting angle that I will be talking about. I think another interesting angle, since we had a business school, is like, you know, we have this financial crisis, or, you know, at least Mendeley went through that financial crisis. And how, how did we look at that aspect of financial crisis? Uh, and then it's, you know, we'll, we are in the academic industry. Um, we started out, we are, we're not doing photo sharing, we're not doing uh, uh, social communication, stuff like that. We are doing something for ourselves, for our own community. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. For those of you who don't know what Mendeley is, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what we do. Um, so essentially what we want to do, and that is, that is and has always been the main focus of our activities, we want to uh, help researchers work smarter, become more productive. And the way we do that is, that's me, one of the founders, and I have like plenty of research papers or case studies or whatever it is. Um, very quickly, even as a, as a master student, you, I think when you write your thesis, you, you very quickly have hundreds of research papers that you have to read, that you have to annotate, that you have to make sense of, that you have to cite in your own thesis eventually. And as you can imagine, as a PhD student, postdoc or professor, professional academic or researcher in corporate, that problem just increases massively over time because there's so much content that you have to consume and make sense of that this is a real problem. And that is how we started, because my friends and me, we had exactly that problem when we started our PhD. We actually already discussed that problem when we were doing our master thesis, and we said, okay, you know, how do you make sense of these research papers? What do you do? What kind of software? There, there should be something. And actually, we came across an article, academic article, peer-reviewed article, that was titled, Why Can't I um, Organize My Scientific PDF Documents uh, Like iTunes Organizes MP3 Files? Very valid question, and so that's what we essentially built. So we developed a software called Mendeley Desktop that works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, we have mobile apps, so you know, full, full user experience. And you can just simply drag and drop your PDF documents in there. And the software we've built in uh, algorithms will extract automatically uh, the content of those research papers and build your digital library, as you can see here, automatically. So it's kind of a iTunes for research papers, which then lets you organize and sort your stuff. And uh, we even have a, a PDF viewer uh, built into the application where you can make annotations and highlights and notes so that you don't have to print off and then you have to, you know, flying around at home or in, in the office or wherever. Um, but what we then do is, if you imagine, you have these little clever intelligent databases on every researcher's computer in that world. Let's assume we can aggregate all that information centrally in the cloud. So basically, we can track what's going on in science right now. And that is the idea that we had, right? You have one little intelligent database on my computer where I have all my papers organized in a certain context, where I have my notes, my annotations. And let's assume we all do that. The, just the knowledge that we have in that room aggregated and analyzed is, I think, an, an awesome knowledge, uh, knowledge base. And just imagine that across all the researchers and students around the world. And by doing this, we believe that we make science more collaborative and transparent because we can drive a huge engine of, of data and, and science where we can say, well, look, you're starting to write your master thesis in that topic you should be talking to that guy over, over there because he just finished his master, master thesis in a very similar topic. Because when I was writing my master thesis, you know, I was so frustrated, I, I thought, okay, there must have been other people, and especially students, that went through the same experience as I am now running through, who have written something about either exactly the same topic or a related topic. And so, you know, by having this huge database of content connected to people and how the, they interact with that content, we would be able to facilitate that. At the same time, we can show for each piece of content what is going on with that content. So let's imagine there's a piece of research that deals with stem cell research. And we can then actually show what is the audience, the social context of that research paper. Uh, who is reading it? How often? 
uh, in context with which other papers. And so you can generate a kind of real-time impact scorecard for people as well as for, for academic content, stuff that is currently just not there. So this is a quick screenshot of the software. Um, you know, you can full text search your stuff. You can see on the upper left-hand corner, you can sort it by collections. You have groups where you can collaborate with friends and collaborators and so forth. It's very intuitive and very easy. And here again, uh, a screenshot um, of the full text PDF viewer. Then something that uh, still creates really a lot of excitement, especially among students, is we have a feature that uh, lets you create your own bibliography. It's a very simple feature, but incredibly powerful. So let's assume you write your paper, and then you put a citation somewhere, uh, and you can cite from Mendeley's database, and when you finish your paper, you just click one button, and at the end, it will automatically create your bibliography based on all the citations that you've made within the documents, formatted according to the citation style that you need or that your professor has request, requested or that the journal has requested that you're submitting the paper to. And that works with uh, 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 LibreOffice or OpenOffice on Linux as well as with Word on, on, micro, uh, on, on Windows. So I think we kind of touched upon a big problem, much bigger than we initially thought. And I was just uh, uh, telling Amar before, when I was doing my PhD, or at least when I was still doing it full time, I was sharing a flat with a friend from my business school who eventually went down the path of becoming a consultant with Boston Consulting Group. And he said, oh, really cool idea, but let's look at the market, right? Let's look at how many scientists are out there. Let's say 2 million, 3 million. What's the typical, con co typical conversion rate to paid users? Let's say 10%. So you have like 200,000 people paying, let's say, $100 each month or $5. You know, that's kind of the universe. It's nice, but actually, you know, probably you're not going to go get anywhere very far with investment and investors because they would think that the opportunity is too small. Well, we now, five years after launch, um, people that use Mendeley have collectively contributed more than 350 million academic documents to our database. And we have already now, five years into, into the existence of Mendeley, more than 2 million users. So I, I think what you have to have, you have a big idea, you have to have a big idea, and you should not obviously approach it from just the pure, let's say, uh, consulting attitude where you say, okay, let's be realistic. No, you have a vision and you want to change science. So it impacts a lot more people than just, you know, the X million professional scientists in the world. The great news about that is that with Mendeley, uh, I think we especially we're tapping into the problem of really also professional researchers, uh, academic researchers at top institutions. So we were lucky to see that uh, based on the email endings that they've signed up with, it's really the top universities of that world. And obviously that helps with investors going down the road. In addition to all these nice numbers, uh, we received so much feedback from people that we changed their lives, especially students who said, well, you know, this works just like magic. Other people said, finally, I can work with my colleagues around the world, that uh, those people sent us positive feedback and said, uh, hey, awesome what you're doing. Uh, how can I help you spread the word? Because we really solve a problem for the individual. So we've built an advisor program, uh, which now has around 1,500 advisors sitting around the world who are kind of evangelists who do this stuff for free just because we help them solve their problem. And so the interesting thing, what we are doing now is whilst we also build a product that helps people solve their problem, we also create, I would call it emotions, because they just feel being helped. And that is incredibly powerful. So when you think about building your startup, also think about not only the, let's say, productive aspect of it, but also think about you know, the emotions. How do people feel about it? Because that is a very distinctive feature going on. Because somebody else might eventually provide a very similar functionality. And in fact, there are tools that provide a sub-functionality of, of what Mendeley does. But they never create this feeling of, hey, those guys are really in for something big. And those guys really want to contribute to opening up science and making people feel better. So 350 million documents, 2 million users, we have 50 people in the company. We can't possibly cater for all these niche disciplines and help solve all these problems of these niche, 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 uh, niche disciplines. So what we are doing is we are giving access to that huge amount of data to third parties, and that might be my dad, that might be cancer patients, that might be other academics, 
to data mine the data that we have collected. And we now have already more than 1,500 developers looking into that data, more than 200 active applications uh, that use that data. And one example is, for example, here uh, called Reader Meter, which is an impact scorecard for academic researchers. When you type in the name of a researcher, it then tells you what are the top 10 most read papers of that author, uh, what is the co-author network, what are certain indices that can be calculated based on that. And then if you look into one specific document, it then tells you, uh, you know, here in that case, what is the discipline of those readers? Are they from biological sciences? Are they from medicine? Uh, what is their status? Are those PhD students or professors? And where are they located? So a system like Mendeley, for the first time, can provide a real-time view uh, into the audience of science. And this is just a quick snapshot uh, of uh, the impact that we have on, on people and what they say about us. And it's actually really cool. Um, there are a couple of things here. Mendeley is the bomb for academic gangsters looking to blow it up or raw like or Mendeley, greatest lifesaver ever. So again, I encourage you to think about not just the aspect of the product, but really uh, engage with your customers to create this emotion because it will differentiate yourself. So, so much for the product and what we've built and you know, the value it provides. Um, some thoughts around the journey that we went. How did we build the company? So that was, that was us. We're funnily enough, three German founders, so three of us. Um, one, Victor, wanted to become an academic. Uh, Paul is uh, the tech guy, I would call him, and me, I'm more on the, let's say, running, running the company side, so I have to make sure that those guys can be successful eventually. Um, and we were working via Skype. So I was in Cologne in Germany, Victor was in Weimar in Germany at our respective universities where we did our PhDs, and Paul was already a web developer in London. And the first one and a half years, I would say, when we kind of, you know, conceptualized the idea and, and went along, uh, we did all that via Skype. We had a Skype uh, chat, real-time chat open all the time. We you know, uh, had tasks and objectives every week that we wanted to com complete besides our you know, PhDs and, and uh, Paul was a freelance developer. And we had Skype calls every week. Um, and then eventually we moved to England. Um, and that was, I think, for us really a life-changing event and also for the company a life-changing event. And why that was the case, I will tell you now, because it was unlocking so many uh, opportunities for us. At that time, Berlin was not yet the hot spot it is right now. It just got started. But even now, I would still prefer London uh, over Berlin, because I, th I still think it's, it's, it's ahead. What, what did it mean to us? So for us, it was really access to the market. Uh, whilst I believe that German scientists are good scientists, I still think that the Academic market is usually dominated by English-speaking countries, namely the US and the UK, and so we needed to be somewhere in that environment. Something that you have to think about, you know, when you build your company, location matters. It does matter uh, for many other reasons. Some of them are access to resources, so, you know, where do you find the talent for your business? Uh, and London is a good place to hire across Europe. Um, it attracts people even from the US because uh, it's obviously English speaking. I would also say that uh, the UK is pretty easy going with visas. So we have a couple of people in the company running on, on immigrant visas. So it, all this is doable. And I, being a German, I know that the German bureaucracy still has to catch up um, on that end. And it's also money. Uh, it is you know building these relationships with VCs and business angels, being there, being present at uh, startup conferences, at events, networking, building that relationship. Because the event of raising money is not a one-time event. It's a relationship that you build. So you get to know somebody. You know they challenge you. They want to invest, but eventually no one invests. A year later, suddenly you become attractive again, and then eventually one person invests, and that then uh, triggers other people to invest as well. And then you also have to think about building your network, um, which is experiences of other entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, which is also experience of VCs, and is the whole kind of uh, view of becoming an entrepreneur. That was uh, our first office. We were lucky enough to uh, be in the offices of Michael Palin, um, and uh, you know, Paul. Uh, here on the upper right hand side. He was a web developer at that time for Michael Palin when he did a video production, uh, television production. And so um, we, he organized a little office space there uh, in Covent Garden for us. There was still us three, and we had a small outsourced team of developers in, in Belarus, something that I would probably not do again. 
But uh, again, you, you make mistakes and then um, uh, hopefully don't make them again. So how did we go about building the business in terms of money? So we were like three uh, poor PhD students. That's kind of the storyline. Paul, in fact, was not a PhD student. He says he's going to do his PhD, uh, PhD once the tools are there. Um, and then we found a guy, Stefan Glenzer. And Stefan has a very, very good reputation in Germany. He is one of the biggest and best known business angels. He has built a couple of companies in Germany and then moved over to London to help build Last.fm. So we say he was actually the founding investor of Last.fm and then uh, uh, executive chairman of Last.fm, which eventually got sold to uh, CBS for quite a nice sum. Um, and the good thing there was we knew Stefan back from business school because he was giving uh, or he was contributing to um, to a class that I took that was entrepreneurship, uh, success factors of fast growing companies. So we knew him already back then. We contributed a case study to a book that he was to publish. And we approached him with that uh, slogan said, we want to build the last of M for research, right? Looking at what people are listening to, we would be looking at what people would be reading, build statistics and build a recommendation engine on top of that. So that was the pitch. And Stefan was very innovative. He was a very innovative entrepreneur. He built a, an auction site as well, Ricardo, that was sold to QuickSell uh, before that. And we told him, look, you're, you're the only guy we're speaking to, and we only want you. Uh, and you get like everything you want, um, and we, ju we just want to work with you. And that was true, um, except maybe for we give you all you want, but that, that was kind of the, the slogan, right? Those guys have a lot of noise around them, so they want to be kind of obviously the guys, and that worked really well. So he seed funded the company um, that we started with our own money. So we put about, I would say, maybe 40,000 euros um, into the seed funding for which we, I, I would call, we sunk it in Belarus. Um, but we, with that thing, we kind of got to something that I would call is close to a uh, prototype. And with that prototype, we uh, got seed money from Stefan Glenzer, and then Stefan Glenzer opened the door to some other investors. So last of him, again, here he was the founding investor and, and executive chairman. Um, we also got the Skype guys on board, um, but not, the, not Niklas Sendström and, and the guys from Atomico, but the founding engineers from Skype. They had set up a fund called Ambient Sound Investment. And the reason why we wanted them on board is because they built Skype, a distributed system, um, desktop installation uh, client server system, and similar to our system, we had desktop software that were distributed ac across computers and would sync with one big server. Uh, and they invested. And then eventually, uh, the former head of digital strategy from Warner Music Group. And that guy was crucial for Warner in building the relationships with uh, iTunes and YouTube. And why we wanted to get him on board was because he went through that valley of tears with the music industry in how to digitize and monetize content that was previously untouched by uh, digital technologies. And like in our industry where you have the PDF, which was before the just printed out journal that was now turned into a PDF, you know, we would have to work with the copyright owners, which were the publishers, and make a statement to them and say, hey, you know, we are here to build a business. We don't want to go through this Napster experience. And we have those people on board who went through that, and if you want to talk to them and uh, want to talk to this guy from Warner, who can tell you all about all the mistakes that those guys did in the music industry, uh, then feel free to do that. And that was really helpful as well. Plus, he had very deep pockets. Now, in 2010, then, we did a very big um, uh, Series A, and the good thing was, in our case, we could do that with the existing investors. So we did not have any additional external investor, um, we did that with the existing investors. That sped up the process, sped up the process uh, you know, significantly because they knew our numbers, they knew our traction. They said, okay, keep your heads down, work, work, we will provide the money. That was lucky, I think it's very unusual, um, but it worked well. And I have to say, if you start a business, funding and people will be the main two items that will not let you sleep at night. Because funding round is also not a kind of one-time event that happens in September 2012, and then you can focus back on the business. It's because it's a process, it constantly keeps going. So you close one funding round, which takes about eight months, that gives you, tw uh, that gives you eight to 18 month uh, runway, let's say. That means four months later, 
to have six months runway, you need to already start raising again. It's something that always keeps you busy, always keeps you running. Um, and people is a similar thing, but I can speak about that in a bit. Um, so funding is an ongoing task. Uh, I always put out, you know, if there are people who are interested to invest, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, we actually closed uh, another funding round uh, back in 2012, end of 2012, with an education-focused VC and uh, the former CEO of Thomson Reuters. Again, you know, not only money, but intelligent money, people who know the industry. So speaking about the interface between academia and, and what we do, and why, in our case, there have been quite some uh, advantages and, and quite some really good synergies. In our case, oh, and that is actually true for obviously every startup, you need to understand your market and you need to understand your users. In our case, we were our own users. We understood the market, we had been in that market uh, for three, four years, trying to do our PhDs, and uh, we were really trying to solve our own problem. Um, sometimes I talk to people who want to, uh, who want to you know, jump into entrepreneurship and, and you know, they try to build a product and then, but my first question would then always be, okay, what is, what is the problem that you're really trying to solve? Rather than building a product and then trying to find the problem for that product to solve, I think it has to start from where, what kind of problem do you want to solve? And the best case is if you're trying to solve your own problem because then you understand the pain and you understand how the product is going to solve your problem. Um, I think in our case as well, academia is a very safe playground, right? You, you have this protected environment. Um, you're being paid, at least it was in my case, I was teaching assistant in, in, in Germany at a German university. I was being paid for research and information management, stuff that was, I was doing anyway. Uh, plus, I do think there is generally the attitude that academics are expected to innovate and, and deliver new ideas. So I luckily had the full support of my professor for that as well. The funny paradox I find is that scientists in general try to innovate stuff, but usually that stuff is outside of the academic world. So they try to uh, invent new methods for, um, you know, or within stem cell research, or new algorithms for uh, within the field of computer science, and all that, all these things that are tremendously useful and valuable outside of outside of academia, but very few people really innovate, innovate and try to innovate within education and science. Now recently, obviously, there have been a couple of uh, trends, uh, these, uh, these online classes, large online classes, for example, Coursera, uh, edX, and so forth, but just before, I found it very funny that all these clever people would put so much effort into work that would help other people to work better, better but not necessarily themselves. Um, and then, I think academia is actually a very, very cool market, and it has really big challenges. Because if we can speed up academia, if you can speed up education, make that more efficient, if you can make science more transparent, more open, more collaborative, I think besides at some point maybe having a really profitable business, I just think that the impact on society are you know, really large, potentially really, really large. And, and that, that makes it very attractive, obviously, to investors, but also, if you think ahead, to, uh, to employee, uh, employees. Like if, if people want to work with cool companies, especially computer scientists want to work on, on exciting challenges, and, and that is stuff that our industry really has, um, has to offer. <clears throat> so what about the financial crisis? And I would say the nice effect about academia, well, actually, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Academia is incredibly conservative, right? As I said, people innovate, but mainly outside not inside, the way people publish research and that research is being vetted and, and uh, brought to students it hasn't changed in 100 years. Has, it's always the same. And you, like, you know, there's a classroom with X people, there's a teacher in front, yeah, people ch start to check Facebook in between, but nothing other than that has really changed. Um, but that also has a, an advantage because academia is almost unaffected by anything that's going outside, on outside. So, you know, Lehman Brothers brought down, uh, uh, um, broke down and all that other stuff that, that was happening really didn't affect us. So it's a nice and stable industry, but it's also very slow moving. So, you know, everything comes with uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, but in any case, I think what you need is, you need obviously a product with, with traction. So you need to demonstrate that, again, you're solving a problem. I've uh, shown you some of these tweets you will have hard, hard usage numbers that you will need to provide. 
Um, and ideally, you know, you should start to make revenues very quickly because that is something that the investors will like. Um, and that is something that will potentially cost you valuation if you can't provide it. Um, in our case, we couldn't provide revenues, but the good thing is our vision was big enough uh, to get the in uh, uh, investors excited. Now, in our case, we also had a support of investors. Something you have to think around is academia very slow moving, so unlikely that there will be very big returns very, very quickly. Uh, because in, in average, already, it will take you about seven years to build a company that is profitable or at some form of other, uh, in some form or another uh, kind of successful, whatever that means. But you really need to have support of investors because if there's an exit pressure for a fund that invests in you that in three years' time from now needs to return money to their own investors, that puts a lot of pressure into, onto you. And in our case, we had this support, long-term vision, yes, we want to create this market share first and then go for the revenues. Then it's about timing. When we started in 2007, 2008, uh, there were about you know, 15 social networks for academics popping up. We really had something very unique that would differentiate us from a pure social network for academics, which was we would solve a person's problem independent from any network effects. Right? For the social network, usually to get benefit, you, know, you need to contribute something, and then you have this chicken and egg uh, problem what's first, right? the user or the value or, or, or the benefit that you get. In Mendeley's case, we had that upfront value independent of any network effect. And um, yeah, then what you need is a tiny bit of luck. I mean, but you can work for your luck. So in our case, uh, if you say you work for your luck, what we did is we attended the hell, a hell of a lot of startup conferences. And that really confirmed us in what we were doing. So we won, I guess, like probably every second European startup award that is there, not because we want to be so cool, but simply because we wanted to challenge ourselves. We wanted to get our name out there. And uh, we just wanted to get that additional traction in order to, um, to get uh, the investors supportive and continue to get them supportive. So that, that worked really well. There was a very nice side effect to that, which was that so far, and especially, again, because we are in academia, we're solving really big problems, we got more than a million euros in funding from the European Union. And that is money that you get without having to give equity. Um, tedious process, I would not, by any means, build on that solely. You have to have your revenue model or your investment model ready without that. But you know, having a million less or more, uh, less or more obviously, um, is, a, is a deciding factor. But then again, back to, I think, what drives all this, which is kind of our vision and what we really want to achieve. Uh, and, and there had, has been a t uh, talk um, by Tim Berners-Lee on TAD, why opening uh, access to research matters. Um, and he was saying all the time, we're very conscious of the huge challenges that human society has now, curing cancer, understanding the brain for Alzheimer's. But a lot of the state of knowledge of the human race is sitting in the scientists' computers and is currently not shared. We need to get it unlocked so we can tackle those huge problems and the key words there are, you know, how can we uh, share knowledge on how can we get it unlocked? And that is the driving vision of what we want to do uh, besides all the entrepreneurial aspects. And uh, we'll see where we get with that. Yeah, so in Mendeley's case, the distribution channel, really, the biggest one is word of mouth. What you just explained is exactly that. That has brought us largely to where we are, I have to say. Um, in that case, it's very tricky to find other ways um, without, let's say, partnering with somebody. And as soon as you partner with somebody, you make yourself dependent as well. Um, so we've obviously discussed with big publishers. We've spoken to Google Scholar, very secretive. Um, so for us, the, the main point really was user love and word of mouth, hence also the advisor program. Um, we, 
uh, you know, obviously try to tap into these viral aspects of, you know, if you set up a collaborative project, you can invite your colleagues. So it's like this virality within the product that we're trying to push, as well as, you know, we're trying, still trying to figure out actually how to best integrate with Twitter and Facebook, right? And if you go on Twitter right now, you will see sometimes, you know, five, six items by one person where they added their own stuff uh, on Mendeley and that integrates then with Twitter. Um, we have never done any kind of uh, Facebook advertising or Google ads on a large scale. We've tried that, but we found the uh, customer acquisition cost to be too high. Um, so right now it's mainly word of mouth uh, and working with universities and institutions, which then taps into the next point is your question was uh, a revenue model or business model. So business model, we have two business models. One is uh, B2C and B2B. And ideally my advice would be you shouldn't do more than one and just really figure out what how that works. In our case, there was such a demand and such a pull effect that we also did a B2B model, which is, you know, you can license and, and upgrade to Mendeley in an, in an individual version, get more storage, better recommendation, whatever. Um, but then we started to have so many users at specific institutions that those institutions reached out to us and said, hey, look, you know, all these people are coming to us librarians and request support. Do you have an institutional model where you can license all that stuff to all our users. And so we set up this B2B model where now the librarian actually becomes our marketing channel because once they license, they have an interest in the tool being used. Uh, and so they help us, help us spread the word. So the business model is beneficial in two ways. It generates money, but it also spreads the word. Okay, first big, uh, biggest mistake was um, doing outsource development, not doing it in-house. You have to own what you do. Nobody else can do your stuff. Second, which taps into basically that same question, we hired people relatively quickly after doing that large seed round because we realized it was a mistake to have that outsourced. But the people we hired were great guys and nothing against them, but they were too unexperienced. And I think um, um, just now Nick said that as well, like the value that experienced people bring to what you do is tremendous. Doesn't mean like you need 15 super experienced people, but you need one super cool engineer who's done it before two or three times, who knows how to hire the right people on the engineering side because again, my background, I mean, I did some development when I was younger, but I'm not an expert. So these two things, um, I couldn't think of something else right now. I think these two things were. Yeah, I would, I would try, yeah, I would try to find somebody who joins your startup as CTO or as, as a, either as a, you know, equal partner or as a CTO with significant equity ownership um, and have that person take care of that problem. Yes, yes, they are. Also a good, uh, a good point because that was also made by my uh, flatmate back then. He said, you know, if I have all these poor students, right? Um, but indeed, they are willing to pay and they're willing to pay a lot because the point is it's not a kind of a vanity tool, but it's really a professional tool that helps people become better. And if you have a problem and, and I, I tell you, you give me $50 and I solve your problem, then you're more than happy to give me that money because it really, and academia is about, you know, you need to know what's going on, you need to organize, you want to get rid of all that painful stuff. And if this is your job, you're willing to invest. Also, interestingly, many of those people don't necessarily pay out of their own pocket, but they are sponsored by grant, they have a departmental budget, eventually the institution might want to pay for them. So it's not always black or white. There are so many, let's say I would say, buckets of money that you can tap into. Um, that I think uh, it's, it's, I mean, for example, we know that the collaboration product that we have where you can sign up to a team product, and that's like the fastest growing revenue. And I now completely understand why Dropbox is knocking everybody out of the water in terms of revenue generation and profitability, because this is, it's crazy. It's, it's really a massive, a massive market. Collaboration and having people work together is, is really massive and people are willing to pay. Yeah. 
Yes, I do think so, and that's something that we're constantly talking, um, talking about with publishers. So I think publishers have to think around what is their value that they provide, right? Before it was kind of curating, uh, curating a journal, making sure that the quality is there, and it's again very similar to what Nick said earlier, where you say uh, you have a magazine and, and, and the editor expects you to read from uh, front to back, and that is the value that they provide, but in effect, actually, the researcher wants to have that piece of research. And yeah, if it's coming from nature and science, obviously it's great because that is one filter criteria, but it's not that I'm reading the whole journal issue number one of nature, right? It's this one individual piece of research. So the question is, what is the value proposition of the publisher? And that is something that the publishers are very, very much struggling with. Um, then there are two other aspects that, that challenge them. One is that they have constantly increased their subscription prices towards institutions over the last 30 years um, and increased more than the consumer price index would increase. So I, I think on average they increase it between 8 and 10% per year. Um, so the universities can't afford all that research anymore. So they have to cut down. That means somebody has to lose. And the other aspect is open access publishing where somebody pays up front and then it's free. So you can't generate multiple revenues on one piece of research. So that's why I think some publishers get it, some don't. Why they have to move from simply content provision to what is the value add, which is kind of services and solutions, right? What do you provide? You provide technologies, you provide clever algorithms, you provide a platform for people to connect, you provide that environment that can capture the activity of the community rather than just, oh, here's another piece of science, another journal article. Um, so there is this friction as well going on, and it's very, very interesting to see how certain publishers react. Anecdotally, I was talking to um, one very conservative publisher, and they were saying, um, they were saying, well, everybody, so everybody has already, ex like, why are you creating this? There, there, there shouldn't be any problem. Everybody has access to the research that they want to because there's all these institutional subscriptions in place. And secondly, everybody who has not access to our research couldn't even possibly understand what we are publishing. So to me, that means, okay, you've reached 100% efficiency, right? So you can go home now because you have maxed it out. Why are you still coming into the office every, every day? And what we see is we are unearthing with this tool, with the data platform that we create, a completely new form of how people interact and use academic content. Um, we have, there, there is one uh, group that is very inf influential in the US, um, uh, patient advocacy, uh, advocacy group, Association of Cancer Online Resources. People like you and me, people who have, let's say, a cancer case in their family, non-academics, they don't have access to academic resources, but they still want to know what is the latest published research on that. And even if they don't understand every, each and every of those 20 or 30 published pages, they still want to know who is the expert in that field, can I get in contact with them, what is the result of that research and stuff like that. And, and there are so many more examples I could give you. Um, where we see actually that these guys can now first see what's out there. They still don't have access to it. That's something we're discussing with the publishers, how to solve that. But where we can unearth a lot more activity and make this research that's there accessible to, the, to society. Right. Yeah, so I mean, we thought uh, very early on, we thought about why isn't there kind of an iTunes business model for research papers, right? Where you can just go somewhere and download a research paper for $5. Um, and so, but we relatively quickly dropped that idea because we felt like if we wanted to start going that route, we would have to agree with each and every publisher really to, to get something set up where they, you know, have to agree on price, you have to agree on all these legal stuff. And that would distract us from actually creating the best end user experience for the researcher. So our thinking was not at all around how can we accommodate or how can we sign up publishers. What happened was that we made the product so valuable to the end users that we got to 2 million users that then the publishers started to ask us and say, hey, interesting, what exactly are you doing? And, and you know, what is it that, that influences our, uh, you know, how we distribute our content? And can we get something out of that? And so that's how we actually start by making the big guys impressed what you have delivered in terms of end user experience, and then they will come by themselves. Actually, 
Right now, we are pushing back. We, we, we cannot handle all these publisher requests and deliver on what we would like to deliver because we have to focus, continuously focus on the end user experience. Eventually, what we want to provide them with is a, a channel for traffic, right? We know what your library looks like, so we know what you should be reading. If we know that this publisher provides that piece of research, then we want to push it to you because you will want to engage with that content. You will want to read that piece of research, even if you don't have a subscription, then you might want to pay for it. Um, and secondly, we want to provide publishers with insights into their audience. So, uh, okay, we know that nature and science are really good brands, but we don't know much about what is the audience really, what does the audience really look like? Is it mainly, uh, you know, PhD students? Is it mainly high, uh, high, you know, high, highly reputed professors? Because the problem is that there's this time lag between the citation graph, right? You have two years time lag between a new piece of research sites, uh, an old piece of research. So, it, you know, it's a very messed up industry and we can help bring transparency into that. Right, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, very good question, but uh, no, <laughs> um, because we wouldn't make that content available publicly. So let's say you have your private library where you have your content that you download from an academic database or from a journal or whatever. You download that and put it then into your Mendeley library. We would then surface that there are these 100 documents, but we would not give access to that. So we would show there's this one piece of research that has one reader a uh, PhD student from Oxford in business, we would not say who you are, we would reveal basically the profile and the location and the discipline, um, but we would, not, we would not give access to that piece of research. In fact, what we would do is we try to figure out who is the publisher and then link to the publisher so that the publisher would get more traffic. Now, what we, what we then have got in, in terms of feedback was that then users said, well, I can't get access to content on your, home, on, on your article pages. And, you know, we know that those guys want to get access to the content. And that is then, you know, you, you compile a list of 100 letters, take these letters to the publisher and say, hey, we know that there are 100 people already just looking at, like, the last three hours who would like to get access to your content. So your argument of all those guys who are out there already have access to your content is not valid anymore. And so, you know, one, one thing leads into the, the other one. I have a um, question that sort of follows on from Claire's. Um, <clears throat> so I use Medley as well for my research, but I, I mainly use it just to download things and sort through my own papers, which was fantastic. And um, now, <clears throat> sort of taking the next step forward to maybe PhD students and professors who use it um, more for, for social sharing and discovery of new articles, how do you stop or have you had problems with people um, sharing their personal content through Mendeley to people that might you know, not have that subscription or how would you deal with personal articles being shared? Right, so, uh, so the way we deal with that is we have very clear terms of use where you as, so to say, the user of the system are not allowed to use the system for uh, illegal users. We cannot, I mean, yeah. 2 million users, 350 million documents, we, we can't possibly police it. And the good thing is, good news is, that is accepted standard, that is accepted legal practice, so to say. There is a legal uh, argument or legal process that, that we have set up, which is called DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is you have a standard process. If somebody who has a problem with that sees something is going on that they don't like, they can tell us and we look into the case and then we take it down. For the rest, it's the responsibility of the end user. That's the legal side. My personal view is that this kind of sharing and collaboration is going on already, right? If you don't use Mendeley, you use Dropbox, email, Basecamp, whatever. So I think the view that we would, uh, or the position that we would take, besides the pure legal aspect is, from a vision aspect, what we need to do is we need to not shut this down and try to make it really difficult for people, but what we should do is we should try to embrace this activity because it's going on already and then find ways of how to make it actually useful for everybody in the industry. So the publisher should be interested in that this is going on, but not with the intent of actually we don't want to cut it, but rather by saying, ah, okay, there are five more people with that profile. They can go back to the university library and say, well, actually there's one download, but five users. 
right? They, they show that their content is being used more often than other content, so they can uh, argue for why should the university keep that subscription. So that is kind of from a philosophical point of view how we see it. And do you see most of your users using Mendeley as a personal um, tool or for sharing? I think it's kind of half-half. I think it starts, the experience, at least in the past, has started with this, you know, own productivity stuff. Exactly, and from there it's like, oh, you use Mendeley as well, and then, ah, okay, let's create a group, and so basically they start to connect. What we've seen in the, in the last few uh, months is that people start using the tool as a first step because they have been recommended to use that tool from an already existing group of people and being invited into a group to work uh, with them. And uh, I know you are talking to publishers. Are you also talking to universities? Yes. Yes, very, very good. Exactly. I mean, that's obviously a logical ne next step. That uh, So, as I mentioned earlier, we have this B2B model uh, where we now license to universities. And the idea is really that how many people still really go into the university library? I mean, for the purpose of research. Many go there, okay, maybe I need to read a book or maybe I need some private space because at home I can't concentrate. But, you know, it's, it's not really... And that is something the librarians are struggling with, not really a place where people research and work together, right? It's more like, okay, instead of sitting at home, I might as well sit in the library. So what we want to build uh, is, uh, well, we have actually launched that already, Mendeley Institutional Edition, which should be the platform for the institution where researchers can connect with each other, work together, discover what other people are doing. Um, that is in early stages. We have about 10, 15 institutional customers. One of them is Stanford. Um, the nice thing what we can um, deliver in addition to that is we can show the librarian what's going on. Like we can show what are the most read journals, what are the most active discipline, exactly. And, and so it's, it's a very powerful platform, but only because we solve the problem of the end user or small groups of end users. Are you, um, sorry. <laughs> I agree. Ideally, ideally, what should happen is that your professor, you know, or the, puts it in that group, invites the people to that group, and you have it there. And ideally, then maybe already annotated by the professor, or you know, where you can then discuss exactly. I mean, that's exactly where we want to take it to. But uh, you know, you can already see. Initially, we wanted to have a very narrow focus, narrowly focused tool for the individual, and then you suddenly have groups and collaboration, then you have an institutional version, and then you need to take care of the publishers, and it's very, very tempting to do all that, but you will not succeed if you try to do all that. Um, in the previous institutions that I've been from, Mendeley is very rarely used on its own. It's always Mendeley versus Zotero versus yeah. Endnote. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always a debate that people have which one to use. But it seems to be the general tools first, that's the one they stick with. Yes. So what do you think it sets Mendeley apart from the other three Mendeley tools in Zotero? Um, so actually, you don't have to use it uh, versus Zotero. You can actually use it vis with Zotero. So we have a, a synchronization functionality. So you can use the two together. Um, so if you prefer to use Zotero to pick stuff from the web, you, it automatically syncs with your Mendeley library. Um, and compared to EndNote, I just think that Mendeley is a better tool, right? I mean, it's maybe not beating EndNote out of the water in all aspects, um, but I think we're pretty much there. Um, and I just think going forward, I believe that our vision and what we want to create will be so powerful and attract so many more use cases and uh, will provide so much more value than just a standalone reference management tool. That right now, I would say, you know, it's roughly comparable. It's true, the thing that people start with is what they stick with. We try to circumvent that by making it easy to import stuff and by having the collaborative groups. So even if there's one legacy user, you still have four other people who might use Mendeley already and you know you have this pull effect. Um, and then again, simply going forward, I, I just think a standalone reference management, yeah, is nice, but it doesn't sh solve kind of the issues that we have in, in scientific research. We had one more question. Yeah. 
Well, no, I mean, I don't, think what you, I don't think you can plan to sell. What you plan is to follow your vision and build a business. And I think if you're successful with that, you will have so many opportunities, which might be an IPO, which might be somebody buys your company, which might be you run a profitable business. I don't think you should start everything with, or oh, what I'm going to do in seven years. Because first, go get to that seven years. When you get there, that question is a luxury problem to have. I've just got one short question. Uh, how did you come up with the name Mendeleev? Uh, uh, so there are two researchers, scientists, uh, uh, Dimitri Mendeleev and Gregor Mendel. Uh, and you connect those two. And actually, from a very practical point of view, the domain name was still free. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks. So that concludes this day.